How familiar are you with the movie Dawn of the Dead? I've seen it. You remember how that group of survivors barricaded themselves inside of a mall? Yeah. You're what's outside of the mall. The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen iZombie, you may want to before watching this video. Six seasons and a movie, as the saying goes. Whether it was a cult classic or a mainstream moneymaker, these days the revival film seems to be a possibility for pretty much anybody. But more than that, we're living in a new age of revival series. Heroes got a revival season, Party Down got a revival season, TNG already had four movies, but it's still kind of got a revival series going on. Dexter got a revival series and is apparently getting two more so they can pull off whatever the opposite of a hat trick is. God help us all. One series that is, ironically, probably not coming back from the dead is iZombie, if only because another revival series came along and sort of stole its thunder. Created by Rob Thomas, no, not that one. iZombie premiered in the mid-2010s on The CW, just a few months after Jane the Virgin and just a few months before Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on the same network. Those three shows were the holy trinity of series that made you wonder, what the hell is The CW doing making a show that's actually good? But the party couldn't last forever. When it came time for iZombie's final climactic season, the show's creator was a bit preoccupied. Showrunner Rob Thomas got to go home again, with a long-awaited revival season of his debut series Veronica Mars slated to premiere alongside iZombie's swan song. So while Rob Thomas was busy buying a Technicolor dream coat for his favorite child Veronica Mars, the concurrently running iZombie came across as an afterthought, shambling over the finish line out of obligation. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and maybe not putting the show's best foot forward in this intro since I absolutely adore the first few seasons of iZombie, hence the existence of this video. Before chowing down on the show's grisly end, let's sink our teeth into the savory halcyon days of iZombie's golden years. This is iZombie. iZombie tells the tale of Liv Moore, who was apparently the only survivor, living or undead, of a patient zero zombie outbreak at a boat party. Zombie Dumb doesn't play by the typical rules in iZombie, and though Liv loses her pulse, her hair color, her pigment, and most of her sense of taste, she retains her mental faculties. However, to keep herself sane, and avoid slipping into an irreversible Walking Dead stupor, she has to subsist on a steady diet of human brains. To avoid more unethical or illegal methods of acquiring said brains, Liv abandons her promising career as a doctor and goes to work in the Seattle PD's morgue, where the city's steady supply of murder victims will save satiate her hunger and stave off going feral. She also abandons her promising engagement to hunky social worker Major Lily White, leaving everyone in her life baffled at the decision. But since one errant scratch or bite while the two are getting their freak on would mean Major gets a major lifestyle change, or I guess undeath style change, she's forced to break things off. It turns out there are side effects to human brain consumption, as Liv begins to both temporarily acquire personality traits and skills from the minds of the deceased, as well as experience visions of their past lives. Deciding to use her powers for the greater good, Liv joins forces with homicide detective Clive Babineau, and uses the victim's visions to help solve their murders, explaining away her supernatural insight into each case by posing as a psychic. And that's the core premise of iZombie. It's pushing daisies, I can't make love to my undead lover due to supernatural rules, as well as effectively asking the victim who did it, meets Chucks ingesting and instantly knowing information and skills relevant to each case of the week, meets Sykes posing as a fake psychic, meets Hannibal's inventive recipes incorporating human ingredients. Despite initially giving up hope of ever recovering her former life, hope comes along all the same in the form of Liv's boss, Ravi, who deduces she's a zombie fairly quickly. But given he has a colorful conspiratorial history that got him canned from the CDC, he's actually pretty cool with it, and starts working on formulating a moonshot cure. Clive, on the other hand, is kept out of the loop. He's a straight arrow, so desecrating the bodies of the victims probably isn't going to fly with him. And on top of that, whenever the topic of zombies comes up in casual conversation, he doesn't really pass the vibe check. I would be a dangerous man after the zombies came. I wouldn't be making any working mistakes. Is that a scratch on my grandmother? Bam! 
Hasta la vista, mi ma. It turns out Liv isn't the only person in Seattle with brains on the brain. The man who infected her, sleazy small-time drug dealer Blaine, survived the boat party as well, and sees a golden opportunity to get out of the drug game and into an exciting new market with no competition. Blaine's devious plot is to infect rich and powerful people throughout the city with the zombie virus, then charge them exorbitant prices for regular brain deliveries from his butcher shop front business, Meat Cute, with abducted teenage runaways serving as his supply. I absolutely love it when characters are bestowed with some sort of bizarre supernatural power, and then they're like, I'm gonna use this to scam people. Blaine's plot quickly escalates into utterly endearing, enterprising lunacy when he decides to upsell his clients into buying premium brains for the personalities and visions they offer. You always wanted to be an astronaut? Well, we'll go murder an astronaut and sell you his brain. Even snatching American heroes off the streets, Blaine can still go about slicing and dicing with impunity, since the chief of homicide is revealed to be on the brain's take from Blaine. Moving those kids' bodies, it's too much. Emotionally or? Because physically, it shouldn't have been that hard. How heavy are bones? Liv and Ravi get wise to Blaine's Meals on Wheels scheme, but realize he's impervious to justice not only because of his police connections, but also because he's passively holding the entire world hostage. If you throw him in jail, you get a zombie outbreak behind bars. And if you just double tap the guy, his unknown list of muckety-muck clients go hungry, then they go feral, and before you can say Leonard Bernstein, it's the end of the world as we know it. I feed Seattle zombies. If I stop doing that job, they don't stop eating and the zombie apocalypse begins. While those in the know are concerned about Blaine's ticking, gray matter consuming time bombs, Major is more worried about the disappearing troubled youths who wind up feeding them. With the police turning a blind eye, Major takes it upon himself to get to the bottom of what's going on, running afoul of Blaine's henchmen, getting the shit kicked out of him on a weekly basis, and just generally ruining his life by constantly witnessing inexplicable horrors and trying to get people to believe him. A lot of shows loop the main characters in on a secret masquerade that they have to hide from their loved ones. Oh, I had to lie to them. I had to not be there for them when they needed me. I had to act callous to keep them from learning the truth. But Liv hiding the truth from Major leads to Major really getting put through the ringer. He's beaten to a pulp, catches a charge, loses his job, and winds up seeing so many insane events only to get gaslit afterwards that he actually believes he's insane and checks into a mental hospital. This nightmare investigation serves two purposes. One, all this physical and psychological abuse is laying the groundwork for a cathartic and spectacular comeuppance for the villains in the season finale. And two, all this physical and psychological abuse means that when Major uncovers on his own that zombies do exist, he unilaterally hates them, which gives Liv cold feet just when she was ready to tell him the truth. These coolers are full of brains. Now it's a lot to absorb, I know, but I will explain everything. And don't worry, because I'm gonna kill them. I'm gonna kill them all. There was also, I think, a secret third purpose to torturing Major throughout season one. Despite his good looks and affable nature, Jock ex fiance with quippy dialogue that all the supporting cast sing praises of is a character archetype modern audiences are, like, psychologically primed to immediately mistrust and dislike. So Major going on this quest to help the innocent who society has left behind, enduring endless personal hardships in the process, all with a struggling but constant smile on his face, was a solid way to win reluctant audiences over on Prince Charming over here. Why was I such a jerk? Who knows? It was just one of the many things I accepted because you're super hot. I'm kidding, to a degree. So... Blaine's evil organization and Major's crusade to dismantle it are just as thrilling and awesome as they sound, with a string of reveals from episode to episode that keep the excitement high. And you're probably wondering, if iZombie Season 1 was such wall-to-wall -wall perfection, then how come it isn't considered one of 2015's most underrated seasons? Well, one, it should be, but two, at its heart, iZombie begins as a procedural, and while the procedural elements aren't bad, they're nothing to write home about either, and they kind of hold the show back from reaching its full, gloriously schlocky potential. Normally, shows with a case of the week structure that also have an overarching main storyline introduce the main storyline in the second half of season one, after getting into a comfortable groove of case of the week investigations that stand on their own. iZombie's main narrative, by contrast, hits the ground running instantly, and as a result, the case of the week investigations feel like filler material from square one, made all the worse because none of the cases of the week are terribly compelling. Some shows are almost entirely about the cases of the week. For example, Law & Order SVU. Not that there's anything wrong with Law & Order SVU. One of life's simple and pure joys is putting it on the hotel TV after a full day at Disney World. But 
with the season-long narrative structure of iZombie, to justify the existence of the cases of the week, the cases should at least thematically reflect on whatever emotions the main characters are wrestling with that week. The two case of the week shows that mastered that were, of course, Pushing Daisies and Hannibal. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm always bringing those two up as the gold standard. I'm the Carly Simon to Brian Fuller's James Bond. Just singing, nobody does it better. The problem iZombie runs into, thanks to its unique premise, is that the brains Liv is eating and the personalities she adopts are the episodic elements that thematically tie into her personal, professional, and relationship struggles that week. But since the brains are filling that role, the cases themselves are just kind of there. They frequently have nothing to do with the main character's story arcs or interpersonal conflicts of the week. Like I said before, cases certainly aren't bad. They're competent, if fairly boilerplate little whodunits, but compared to Blaine's brain racket, none of the Seattle PD's investigations are really going to stick with you. I just rewatched the show, and there are already episodes in season one where I can't recall who the killer was. They can be that forgettable. As far as the week-to-week -week brain overwrites themselves, those tend to be more memorable. iZombie can play the personality rewriting a number of different ways depending on the episode at hand, and gets fairly creative with it. There are just the silly brains for fun, like when Liv eats the brains of a frat bro, a doting mother, a catty housewife, a magician, or a crotchety old racist. You're gonna need a zippy. Thanks, Clive. You're one of the good ones. There are brains that instigate conflicts with the people close to her, or explore darker sides of Liv's personality by exacerbating some of her negative traits. Like when she willingly chows down on some alcoholic's frontal lobe so she can go on a bender after Blaine kills her zombie boy toy Lowell. Some brains give her special skills she'll need to navigate the dangers of the episode. Liv ate the brains of an army sniper? Better not stand near any open windows. Liv eating the brains of a man plagued by hallucinations is another highlight, especially with the big reveal that the stoner weatherman helping her out in the case, played by the guy who voices the announcer in Ratchet Deadlocked, was in her head all along. Your hair is fine. Oh, my vanity is the issue, not your breaking and entering. And last but not least, sometimes the brains are just there to make Liv do something really horny. Stripper brains and dominatrix brains. I'm sure you see where this is going. It's a consistently fun element of the series, and Rose McIver gets to stretch her legs and play some increasingly wacky versions of herself. Though the series does a good job of establishing her as a real, singular character, influenced by the brains she eats, as opposed to a shell of a character that serves as a vessel for each week's gimmick to take over. McIver mostly rises to the occasion with each new spin she has to sell, and when it does fall flat, it's less on her and more on the writers. It's an uncommon occurrence, but when the writers are out of touch with the subculture Liv is meant to suddenly become a member of, things can go from quirky to cringy on a dime. Full Auto has claimed he killed you for exterminating all of his soul brethren. Sim Reaper exterminating Full Auto's soul brethren could have cost a serious player many thousands of dollars. I mentioned the forgettability of the weekly murder mysteries, but as season one of iZombie approaches its conclusion, there are a handful of cases that come alive courtesy of Max Rager, the slimy energy drink company run by the equally slimy Von Duclark. Realizing a combination of his energy drink and a tainted batch of the fictional narcotic utopium may be what causes zombification, Von Vaughn is gearing up for total zombie genocide to cover his tracks. It's more of a teaser. Vaughn is going to be the big bad of season two. But the teaser itself is thrilling enough, with Max Rager's hired goon nearly assassinating Liv, getting killed in the showdown with her, then coming back for round two, since she got a little scratchy in the first altercation. What happened to his face? A boat ran over him. And he survived. Well, you know, as a matter of speaking. Vaughn may be eyeing up the big bad throne for season two, but we've still got season one's big bad to deal with. After Major uncovers the truth, he's captured and tortured by Blaine and his meet-cute zombie mooks. MacGyvering an escape, Major takes off into the night, utterly terrified and planning to skip town. Oh wait, no he doesn't. After escaping captivity, Major strolls outside to his car, retrieves the arsenal of firearms he bought in a fit of zombie paranoia, then strolls right back into the meat cute and massacres Blaine's henchmen. If you told me in the first 10 minutes of the pilot that the season was going to end with Major pulling a Travis Bickle set to Dare Commissar, I don't know if I would believe you. Or I'd, you know, believe you. Stranger things have happened. I'd just watch the show faster to get to it because it sounds awesome. It is awesome. It is so awesome. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ravi has concocted two doses of a potential zombie cure, the only two possible given their finite access to the tainted utopium required to produce it. 
The plan is for Liv to take one dose and leave the other with Ravi for further research and future mass production. But with Major mortally wounded following the meet-cute shootout, the priority of who needs the jab first is thrown out of whack. While Blaine gloats that Major has accomplished nothing, since he can just make more zombie henchmen and make more zombie customers with a few scratches, Liv sticks Blaine with the cure, using him as their guinea pig and denying him any further aggressive business expansions in the process. Make more now, bitch. What did you do? Your cure. Muzzle tar. Did you... Is this... Oh, no. In order to save Major's life, Liv turns him into a zombie before he can bleed out. But, given his interactions with Team Z so far have left a terrible first impression, Major is still on Team Kill All Zombies, and he's ready to include himself alongside all zombies before he'd ever willingly eat human brains. To talk Major off the ledge, Liv gives him the final cure, though the relationship they've both been desperate to rebuild all season is now on the rocks, since he knows what she is and severely mistrusts her. The Chief of Homicide on the take from Blaine stumbles on the obliterated meat cute, leaves behind a note implicating Blaine, then burns down the building via gas explosion. Liv's brother happens to catch a face full of explosion passing by the building at the same time, and Liv has to refuse to supply a blood transfusion when he's rushed to the hospital, since her blood has been standing water for a year now. Clive suspects Major is involved in the meat cute murders because of Major's erratic behavior throughout the season, Vaughn readies to pull the trigger on his cover-up, and that's season one of iZombie. There's enough playful fun from the brain-chomping character traits to keep each episode light, plenty of exciting and unexpected revelations to chain each episode together, and to cap it all off, the finale is positively jaw-dropping. The finale also deals audiences a full hand of cliffhangers to ruminate on waiting for season two, which means going into iZombie's sophomore year, this brain train ain't slowing down. Submarine movies, big fan. And there's always this moment. It's the moment where the sub is torpedoed and the compartment is flooding and the captain's got to give the order to seal it up. Even though he knows that there are men still alive in there. Suspected zombies, your mission? Determine which ones are the real deal and close that hatch on them. Von Du Clark is intent on protecting Max Rager's brand image, which means he plans to put zombie kind on the endangered species list. And who better to employ in his zombie killing campaign than the world's foremost zombie killer, Major Lily White, who was coerced into becoming Max Rager's one-man wet work division when Vaughn offers to take Liv off the zombie hit list if Major does their dirty work. Vaughn's making a list of Seattleites who dye their hair, spray tan their skin, and purchase hot sauce in bulk, and it's up to Major to check it twice and determine which need to get whacked. Oh, bonus incentive to do Max Rager's dirty work. If Major doesn't, Vaughn's just gonna kill everyone on the list. Zombie or no. Vaughn's idea was to send them all letters, zombies and non-zombies alike, informing them they'd want an all expense paid Hawaiian cruise and then scuttle the ship. Aiding in Major's detective work is the zombie cure's unusual side effect. After reverting to human form, Major has developed a zombie spidey sense, which makes determining undercover dead men a cinch. Of course, being forced to kill innocent people against his will takes a massive psychological toll on Major, and he falls into a self-destructive spiral, withdrawing from his friends, becoming addicted to utopium, and engaging in self-loathing hookups with his Max Rager handler Rita. Rita plays good cop to Vaughn's bad cop, and unbeknownst to Major, is also Vaughn's long-suffering daughter. Okay, good cop is a little too far. More catty manipulator to Vaughn's cartoonishly monstrous supervillain. Everything we have you do, and it's a privacy issue, which gets your panties in a twist. I assumed the deal was if I cooperated, you kept live out of this. Oh, well, when you assume, you... Despite Daddy presumably setting her up with a pretty sweet Max Rager salary, Rita quickly learns that crime doesn't pay. During a teensy-weensy little zombie out of containment incident in Max Rager's ominous underground lab, Vaughn remembers that old axiom, you don't need to be faster than the drug-enhanced super zombie, you just have to be faster than your daughter. A pretty shocking, unexpected moment that's so shocking, even the giggling sociopath Vaughn is left shaken. One day, years from now, watching your kids run around, assuming you could still have kids, whatever, maybe they'll be adopted, who cares? We're gonna lock eyes and we'll think, remember that whole crazy secret basement thing? I appreciate the series continuing the major abuse, but I also appreciate the unconventional and low-key resolution to his self-loathing spiral. No, 
public embarrassments due to his drug abuse, no caught-in-the-act confrontations, no circle of friends staging an intervention as the music swells, just an impactful moment as he crosses paths with the troubled kid he used to mentor. It makes him reflect on how far he's fallen. And then the reveal that he hasn't been killing his targets, he's just been abducting them, hoping the cure that saved him will one day be replicated and get them all off Max Rager's radar. Unfortunately for Major's menagerie of frozen captives, Rita joining the ranks of the undead means Von Duclark has a vested interest in curing rather than killing. So after he discovers Major hasn't held up his end of the bargain, Von doesn't mind, since it means Max Rager now has a whole list of lab rats. It's Friday. I'm in love. So what do I owe the pleasure? Come on, the cure? I don't know why I bother. Those disappearances start to take a toll on Blaine De Beer's bank account, since many of them are his customers. Switching from abducting runaways to running a funeral home, Blaine is out of the murder business, but still in the brain business. When Ravi discovers that the zombie cure is only temporary, he and Blaine form an uneasy alliance. With Blaine tracking down the source of the tainted utopium necessary to make more cures out of self-interest. Especially when it's revealed that the zombie cure is not only temporary, but eventually lethal if not injected regularly. Yeah, it becomes a bit of a running thing that the iZombie writers are constantly inventing new rules and caveats for the cure so they can pull new dramatic angles for the series out of their asses whenever they feel like. The first cure works perfectly and gives you zombie detecting powers, but it's temporary and eventually becomes fatal, and we can never know when death will strike, but we've discovered a way to delay what makes it fatal. The second batch of the cure is permanent, but it doesn't cause zombie detecting powers, but it does cause total amnesia, but maybe it doesn't cause amnesia, but just in case it does cause amnesia, we're making a cure for amnesia, but the cure for amnesia doesn't work and it just makes visions last longer. So Ravi starts working on a zombie vaccine instead, which succeeds at preventing permanent zombification, but still turns you into a zombie once a month. Ah, uh, yeah, whatever, sounds about right. If we have any doctors in the audience, I think this all checks out. Science is whatever we want it to be. Liv and Ravi being forced to cooperate with Blaine is a hilarious highlight of the second season. Though at times it feels like the show forgot just how nasty the character was in season one. It's a common thing in fiction to bring back fan-favorite villains as reluctant allies to the heroes and forgive their unbelievably heinous sins from the first entry a little too easily. Sure, Liv will occasionally remind the audience that Blaine was a kidnapper, extortionist, torturer, murderer, and as we'll learn this season, he even forced a woman into sexual slavery, but when it comes time for the characters to share the screen, they treat him more like a sitcom arch nemesis, like he spent last season pranking Liv at the office and stealing her parking space, not murdering her boyfriend and torturing her ex-fiance. Outside of his self-interested alliance with Ravi, Blaine isn't exactly keeping his nose clean either, and spends the rest of his time in Season 2 pitting wits with two new villains in the Emerald City. The first is local crime lord, Mr. Boss. Mr. Boss is an interesting idea. Dropping some standard crime lord baddie, oblivious to the zombie plot, in, who feels like he's from a completely different show who, despite some violent capabilities and powerful connections, is woefully in over his head, since he's unaware what type of show he's a villain in. Blaine is eager to take over his turf, and goes about it in a roundabout way, by becoming an informant against Mr. Boss, spilling his guts to the assistant district attorney, Peyton Charles, who just so happens to be both Liv's best friend and Ravi's ex-girlfriend. The second villain is Blaine's own abusive, zombified father, who wants to take over Blaine's zombie racket. Those plans are scratched, <laughs> scratched, when Papa De Beers disappears courtesy of Major, whose work has led to him being dubbed the Chaos Killer by the press. Since the circumstances of his father's apparent demise involved foul play, Blaine is denied his inheritance in his father's will, leading to a captivatingly tense confrontation when he crosses paths with Major once again, to uh, negotiate his father be transferred to Blaine's captivity. Unlike with Liv and Ravi, the bad blood between the world's only two cured zombies is palpable. Donnie! How soon can you have a grape duck? I have plans, actually. A few hours. Well, let's get her done. 
With all that action going on in Blaine's world, you'd probably think that the events with him are going to come to a spectacular head for a second time as the season comes to a close. But all of those plot threads sort of fizzle out when he takes the second dose of the cure and comes down with a bad case of total amnesia. So he's really in no position to resolve any of those storylines he's tied up in, since he doesn't know what's happening in any of them anymore. The big question on everyone's minds, including the audience, is what with this being dirty, duplicitous Blaine and all, is he faking it? It's a very soap opera-y mystery I always found more frustrating than enticing, because at the end of the day, if he got amnesia, didn't get amnesia, got amnesia but had his memories restored by the anti-amnesia serum, or got amnesia but his memories came back naturally on their own, no matter what, it just means the already flimsy make-it-up-as-the-writers-go cure rules are going to get even more convoluted when the truth comes out faking it or not, watching for the first time, I couldn't imagine a scenario where my reaction to the truth coming out would be positive. Either I'd predict the truth and feel annoyed that the show wasted all that time trying to pull the wool over my eyes, or it would fool me and I'd feel like a sucker for wasting my energy seeing secret character hints and motivations that weren't actually there. It won't come out until the middle of season three, but yeah, He's faking it. You lose your memory for a few days, then it comes back. He's not even faking it for a grand evil scheme either. He just wanted to get in Peyton's panties, but she put the kibosh on their burgeoning romance when she learned what a dirtbag he is. Now that he's Mr. Nice Guy, he can prove Green Day wrong and finish first. I really seem to inspire negative reactions in people. Is it something I said? More like the things you've done. Such as? How much time have you got? Taking the bad boy angle to the art of seduction is Liv's new token zombie boyfriend of the season, Drake. He's working for Blaine and Mr. Boss, playing both sides. Or rather, playing all three sides, as we later learn he's also an undercover cop. But really, the main reason he's here is to complete the Liv and Major love triangle this season. I don't really have much to say on the guy or any of Liv's non-major boyfriends, really, because my brain is trained to not get too invested. They're like Spinal Tap drummers. I thought of that joke while in the middle of my rewatch, and I was like, I'm so clever, ha ha ha. And then the next episode of the rewatch, Ravi made the exact same joke. He stole it from me. It is sort of like being the drummer for Spinal Tap. <laughs> We were all thinking it. As you can probably tell, iZombie Season 2 is spinning a lot of plates, which makes the season inherently exciting as some of those plates start to crash to the ground in spectacular, dramatic fashion. It's fun watching characters uncover secret plots that we as an audience have been privy to for some time, or ponder how puzzle pieces set up earlier in the season are going to pay off later. That being said, with so much going on, I did realize in hindsight that some puzzle pieces never really slot into place. iZombie Season 2 has a habit to go for the razzle-dazzle from time to time, hinting at potentially game-changing events that either go nowhere or are reverted the following episode. Major manages to slip a listening device into Vaughn's Fitbit, which he never uses and which never comes up again. Liv promises to restore her relationship with her brother after denying him a transfusion, only for her to never bring her family up again until the brother returns. In season five, Clive breaks off his partnership with Liv because she's such a maverick, even though, damn it, she gets results. And they're teamed back up in the next episode. Eh, granted, the narrative has so many moving parts, and they're moving so fast, it's liable to fly right past you and not be an issue. And some of the plot lines that are teased but never go anywhere are deliberately shut down prematurely for the sake of a gag. Ravi and Blaine wrestling over the zombie poison they accidentally invented, because as soon as Ravi realized what it was, he knew Blaine the chronic villain would steal it and figure out what to do with it later, is one of the funniest moments in the season. Another benefit of all this meat on the narrative bone is the expansion of Clive's role in the series, since in the first season he was more or less all cases of the week all the time, and sort of wound up the odd man out as a result. In season two, he gets a love interest in FBI agent Basio. He gets to expose more of his guarded personality, which I enjoy as being sort of Clive having a guarded nature, not a result of past trauma or embarrassment about his interests. 
and he gets tied up in the main storyline when he and Bazio get hot on the Chaos Killer's trail. After putting Major behind bars, Liv reveals the truth behind zombies to Clive in a desperate final play to feed Major before he goes feral in lockup. In a sadistic final choice, Clive has to betray his girl to save the world and get the killer they've been searching for all season off on a technicality. Do you believe me now? With the Chaos Killer sprung from the Huskow, all that's left to do is rescue his victims by storming Max Rager's lair, where they're being held as lab rats. Liv, Clive, and Major go undercover to infiltrate Max Rager's Super Max product launch party, where employees experiment with tainted utopium and a feral zombie outbreak sweeps through the building, even killing the party's performing artist, Rob Thomas. Yes, actually that one this time. Liv, Clive, and Major survive the Horde and make their way to Max Rager's secret underground lab. It's always gotta end with a secret underground lab. Haven't you ever played a Resident Evil game before? The meet-cute shootout that punctuated last season was certainly a tough act to follow, but Liv, Clive, and Major navigating a secret lair full of zombies and death traps, all while Vaughn takes over the loudspeaker for a third-act villainous meltdown, is truly something to behold. It really doesn't get any better than this. Welcome to the after party, folks. Major, can you hear me? Are we having fun yet? The gang escapes Vaughn's death traps. Liv and Major put their feral zombie ex-lovers out of their misery, and Vaughn gets eaten alive. Oh, and the amnesiac Blaine saves Peyton from some of Mr. Boss's henchmen. But it's hard to not just see that B-plot as a distraction when everything going down in the Max Rager sub-levels is so face-meltingly exciting. I know you're a fan of submarine movies, so I'm sure you'll understand. No, 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 no! No! Good luck! No! 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 Once the dust is settled, private military contractor Fillmore Graves arrives to clean up Max Rager's mess and cover up the events of that night's party. Not a mystery as to why, when it's revealed that all of Fillmore Graves' employees and their families are zombies, following a company picnic gone very, very wrong. They're preparing for D-Day, Discovery Day, when the truth about zombies comes out to the world. When it happens, they want to be ready, but they're not ready just yet. So that's season two of iZombie. It's an improvement over the already joyous first season, whether it's in the little details like the introduction of Liv's cooking montages, or in the bigger changes like the scene-stealing, scenery-chewing season arc villain Vaughn, and the expansion of Clive and Ravi's narrative significance and characterization. Though, unlike the first season, where the what will happen to the gang next year cliffhangers were all headed in fairly clear directions, the big cliffhanger of season three leaves the door so wide open, it could go anywhere. Is the status quo going to be radically changed next season? And will it be right away or over time? Will this PMC turn out to be a powerful new ally, a dastardly new foe, or something more in between? Let's hop over to season three to find out. Someday soon, Seattle's going to be the capital of the zombie homeland, and a lot of people aren't going to want to see that happen. So are you with us? Or against us? After the full-blown zombie hoedown at Max Rager, it's becoming increasingly apparent to everyone in the know that the zombie secret can't be sat on forever. Season 3 of iZombie is about all the characters getting their ducks in a row, so that when the truth comes out, they can face the future, not angry mobs and pitchforks. Or, more likely, angry mobs and sawed-off shotguns. Ravi infiltrates the Doomsday Prepping Wham Bams Gun Club to try and enlighten them about zombies' innate humanity and steer them away from any wanton zombie killings. Blaine's right-hand man Don E and Blaine's equally evil dad team up to open a zombie bar and brain grill named The Scratching Post. Though after dropping the amnesia facade, Blaine does a hostile business takeover and traps his dad at the bottom of a well. Fillmore Graves has the grand designs, preparing their soldiers and their zombie families to take over the city of Seattle and make it a zombie homeland. This extends to also bolstering a secret zombie candidate for mayor, so they'll have one of their own in charge. Though, one does wonder if the simpler tactic might be to just sit around and let two humans duke it out, then scratch the winner. An underhanded tactic of seizing power, but the lengths Fillmore Graves is willing to go to to protect their own and create a city where they can feel safe is ambiguous at the moment. Liv and Clive continue their partnership, with iZombie refreshingly not bothering with the typical I can't believe you would keep this secret from me pouting you might have expected from Clive, the last character to be brought into the loop. 
In fact, now that Clive is privy to why Liv has such an eclectic personality and rampant mood swings, he's become an even more hilarious straight man. Not that you're going to be shortchanged on pouting at the start of Season 3. After failing to aid Blaine during his shootout to rescue Peyton, Ravi falls into a self-loathing, whiny despair when he learns Peyton hooked up with Blaine before learning about his monstrous, meet-cute past. Ravi prattles on to any character who will listen about how he's so sad Peyton slept with Blaine. He's so sad he chickened out during the shootout. Oh, oh, life is meaningless because I didn't get the girl. Hanging his head, all while Christmas time is here, plays in the background. What's the point? Oh, come on. And the point is to use your wraith abilities to exact revenge on the forces of Sauron. In the largest sense. In a world absent meaning and justice. It's a fairly pathetic, frustrating direction to take the character. Doubly frustrating because Peyton left him at the end of season one so she could flee the city in horror after learning the truth about zombies. In contrast to season three, the start of season two, freshly dumped Ravi was remarkably mature about the whole situation. He and Peyton had only dated for a couple months, and he realized with that bombshell dropped on her life, she had bigger fish to fry. So, no hard feelings. Plus, he's comfortable in his own skin and knows he's a catch, so he's confident about putting himself back out on the market. It all felt very in character. Mopey Ravi feels very out of character, like the show is reducing him to a character archetype. Ravi's a scientist, scientists are nerds, nerds throw fits over not getting the girl. Another character that the writers aren't really sure what to do with this season is Major, but since he was the guy driving the plots of the previous two seasons, it's okay if he takes a back seat in year three. He can't find work ever since being accused of being the chaos killer, so he joins Fillmore Graves to put food on the table, as well as make some friends who actually know the truth of his Max Rager zombie breakout mission last season. He grows sicker and sicker as the first cure wears off, and has to take the second cure, with the amnesia only lasting a day, and all the hemming and hawing and tender moments about him losing himself turning out to be a giant fake out. But it was more about the journey than the destination, so eh, I'll allow it. He hides his renewed humanity from his new zombie co-workers, but eventually the truth comes out. And rather than return to the human world that hates him, he reinfects himself to stay with the zombies that respect him. My only real issue with the plot of Major picking which team he wants to play for this season is that magical cure rules aside. Up until this point, iZombie was a show with a consistent internal logic. Here's all the rules about how zombies work, and we're going to abide by them. Here's Blaine's brain business, and we're not just going to drop it after season one when the character is defeated. Max Rager, Super Max, Utopium, Tainted Utopium, everything jives. But when Chase Graves, the owner of Fillmore Graves, a zombie private military contractor plotting to take over Seattle and make it an independent zombie nation, learns that one of his soldiers was somehow impossibly cured, he doesn't care how, he just fires him. I mean, zombies being capable of reverting back to human state must have huge ramifications for everything Chase is planning. But he doesn't ask Major any questions like, how on God's green earth are you human again? It's just, don't let the door hit you where God split you. I gave the show the benefit of the doubt at the time, since Robbie's stash of cures was stolen by an unknown character, and I just assumed the perpetrator was Chase Graves. But as we learn in season four, Blaine stole them. So no. Devote all our vast resources to manufacturing a cure to zombieism? Well, I kind of had my heart set on this whole ridiculous zombie island scheme. And, I mean, we already made all the uniforms for our upcoming autocracy. I, I mean, Utopia. You know, our super cool zombie uniforms. The ones with fingerless gloves. I see no potential issues there. Okay. Chase Graves is maybe not the sharpest sharp thing in the tool shed. What matters is that you put zombies at risk every time you went out in the field. It's not something I can allow to continue. You're no longer an employee of Fillmore Graves, effective immediately. Unlike seasons one and two, where the larger plot involved a mustache-twirling villain running an evil business that the main characters needed to uncover and shut down, the third season is structured like a mystery. The mystery structure does a good job of getting more of the main cast involved in the A-plot, where previously the A-plot was basically just the major show, but at the cost of being a bit more aimless than what came before. There's a pattern of murders targeting zombies sweeping throughout Seattle, including the previous operator of Fillmore Graves, Vivian Stoll. Liv's a zombie herself, so she's invested. One of the families targeted included an ex of Clive's and her child, so he's out for vengeance as well as reflecting on his happier past now that the memories have been dredged up. And as mentioned earlier, Ravi is going undercover to investigate the zombie-hating leader of the Wham Bam's gun range, Red Harrington. Meanwhile, Peyton is investigating a false confession of a murdered dominatrix linked to a mayoral candidate. Yes, that zombie mayoral candidate, which means that even the dead dominatrix 
is somehow tied up in this. Undead slut. Uh, take it back or clean my shoe with your tongue. I'm not gonna... Do it or suffer! Oh. Make it shine. Frankly, Meet Cute and Max Rager are tough acts to follow, and the redneck jerks of Wham Bams are neither intriguing nor threatening enough to tie the season together, especially since, with all the political conniving going on at Fillmore Graves, it's pretty obvious all these zombie murders are part of a Graves power grab, not a wave of zombie hate crimes. Despite its mystery structure, iZombie Season 3 does seem worried it's going to be too obvious with its hints, instead electing to play its cards close to the vest, or save all its hints until only minutes before they pay off. Like, the villain's plot is a coup within Fillmore Graves in order to create more zombies, which means strength in numbers, which also leads to more people with zombie loved ones in the hopes of creating more zombie sympathy. They're going to distribute vaccines throughout Seattle tainted with the zombie virus. So here's the bind the writers were in. If we're teasing some vaccine coming to Seattle all season, everyone and their mother is going to guess it's tainted with the zombie virus and part of an evil scheme. If we just wait to spring it on the audience until the finale, it's going to feel rushed. But they went with option B rather than risk audiences guessing it in advance. By contrast, there was a side plot this season about Major dating a pen pal who turned out to be some sort of, like, chaos killer fangirl harvesting footage for a fan page. And yeah, it was really obvious that was where the storyline was headed, but I didn't mind, because the characters' emotions were relatable and the journey was engaging. Even the final villain reveal suffers from this better to be dull but a surprise than be interesting but predictable mindset, with the mastermind behind the conspiracy being some random lady who works at Fillmore Graves. You probably really recognize the character's face, you might remember the character's name, but name one thing about her besides she's the secret villain of season three, I dare you. The person who uncovers her scheme isn't even one of our heroes. It's Chase Graves, who basically looks at the camera, points at the villain, and says, remember every murder that didn't get solved yet this season? Well, she did them. <sighs> We've come a long way from Von Duclark's underground zombie death maze. I just decided what to do with you. There are more of us. Chase! Apologies if I'm coming down a little too hard on season three, since for the most part, the ride is just fine. Crestfall and Ravi aside, the characters are just as lovable and energetic as ever. The brain concepts continue to be amusing, there's a handful of decent, suspenseful thriller sequences, and the cases of the week are still fun enough to hold your attention episode after episode. But that's just the risk you run when you make your season a mystery. If the final reveal is underwhelming, the ride to get there is lessened in hindsight. 10,000 people are infected by the tainted shot, and live races to hijack a news broadcast to inform people of the rules of zombie before chaos erupts. She succeeds, only for Chase Graves to arrive with his own presentation that's all, like, edited and ready to go and everything. Did our heroes even need to get out of bed for the season 3 finale? Seems like Chase already has everything covered. You were here too late. You could have rescued me. Mutiny, led by Carrie. The U.S. government quarantined Seattle, with the human inhabitants serving as de facto hostages, preventing Uncle Sam from just atomizing the city. The zombies say to the humans, We only intend to harvest brains from the dead, so let's all try to get along. We don't want you to feel like human shields, but let's not mince words. You are human, and you will be acting in a shield-like capacity. While well, they spent three years trying to hide their existence, the optics war is only beginning. It's Seattle versus the world, zombies versus humans, and zombies versus themselves as an undead dictatorship unfolds in season four. It's a good team for zombies. But why? We're zombies. Zero tolerance. That's our message. Welcome to New Seattle, where walls and checkpoints have been erected to prevent zombies from leaving, but also to prevent humans from entering, while living in a police state run by a brain-eating, undead private military might sound dystopian, it turns out there are people all across America willing to subject themselves to it so they can go zombie virus bug chasing. After running a SWOT analysis and realizing the opportunity to become immortal is just too good to pass up. Or who knows? Maybe the people trying to break into Seattle just really, really want to see the Museum of Pop Culture's Nirvana exhibit. Unmoved by the Scorpion's power ballad, Winds of Change, Chase Graves is aggressively maintaining the borders of New Seattle, since the massive influx of zombies, courtesy of the tainted vaccine, has led to a brain shortage. And if people keep sneaking into the city, looking to use the zombie virus as a miracle cure for their terminal illnesses, it could lead to mass zombie starvation. On top of that, if feral zombies start spilling out into the greater continental United States, the US military might have to revisit that whole 
nuke Seattle plan. It's pretty clear Chase Graves is being set up as the villain of season four, but I think the intention is to make him more of a sympathetic villain, a man who had his people's best interests at heart, but ultimately collapsed into tyranny and resorted to needless violence due to the pressures of leadership. That's fine on paper. In practice, Chase Graves is kind of all over the place, because his strategy for maintaining the chaotic zombie cesspit of New Seattle is, well, he doesn't seem to have a strategy. At the start of the season, his intention seems to be to win the global PR war by showing he's tough on crime and won't allow infections to rampantly spread under his watch, to appease those outside the walls who want to bomb the city to prevent any brewing zombie apocalypses. In defiance of this good behavior isolationist plan, he also abducts the daughter of a US Army general from outside the walls and brings her into the city as a hostage which seems very at odds with his previous strategy. And come on, that's your plan? You're going to kidnap the daughter of a key US political figure, bring her back to your village and infect her with the zombie virus? You're just begging to get your ass kicked by Leon S. Kennedy. He loves you, I assume. Yes, of course he loves me. Well, then I think his long-standing desire to turn Seattle into a parking lot will be mitigated. <laughs> Amateurs. It's tough to get a read on Chase given his ideology and morals seem so inconsistent. He builds an anvil guillotine on the town square to execute zombies who spread the virus, even if the recipient was terminally ill and received it willingly. But no head smashing for people who knowingly spread the virus through sexual contact, where the infected party didn't even want to become infected. Ah, nobody's perfect. We all want to get our undead rocks off, just prison time for you. He stops a guy who tried to assassinate him from bleeding out by turning him into a zombie, just so he can put him on trial as a zombie. Uh, why? Whatever. Sure. Sometimes he mistrusts everyone in his organization. Sometimes he lets them peer pressure him into doing whatever they say. Sometimes he's extra tough on his own underlings who fail him. Other times he runs cover for them, despite their screw-ups. And he lets Blaine continue to grow fat off his independent brain racket, despite the city's shortages. Supposedly as a tit-for-tat, Blaine has connections, can't live without him thing. But really, Blaine doesn't have connections. He's just completely unscrupulous and willing to murder people to get what he wants. iZombie kind of unintentionally creates a sort sort of in the pale moonlight relationship between Chase and Blaine, where Chase is just delegating dirty work to Blaine so the blood won't be directly on his hands. That's why you came to me, isn't it, Captain? Because you knew I could do those things that you weren't capable of doing. So yeah, Chase feels less like a character with his own identity and morals and goals, and more like he's playing Mass Effect and always choosing the renegade options so that he'll have enough bad boy points to pass the big speech check at the end of the game. Major follows suit with his boss, sometimes an unwitting tool of an oppressive regime willing to skirt the law to help his friends and his annoying kid trainees, other times a jackbooted thug gleefully just following orders. Give me the number, or they'll spend the next week in a Fillmore Graves for education camp. Or for your dumbass, an education camp. After Chase Graves puts human smuggler Renegade, who scratches the terminally ill to save them, to death in wily Coyote fashion, Liv is inspired to take up the Renegade mantle and continue her operation. Also going for a positive zombie PR angle, just with a different approach, Liv is making a documentary with her fellow renegades, showing the life-saving humanitarian efforts of their wanton scratching, despite the strain it puts on the city's limited brain resources. In her efforts to save the incurable, Liv even comes across a teenage girl immune to the zombie virus. Though it's sad she came all this way just to die anyways, Ravi learns that her brain may function as a one-time zombie cure to any zombie who eats it. I'm sure the tragic death of the playful and kind-hearted Isabel was a tear-jerking moment for many, but the littlest cancer patient trope has been forever ruined for me by Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. We're doing all we can, but I'm not Jesus Christ. I've come to accept that now. I've got to get this. Son of a bitch. The whole renegade operation occasionally feels half-baked when Liv has to pull double duty doing that 
and the cases of the week, but the storyline does manage to come alive in the 11th hour, when Chase Graves demands Liv turn herself in, lest her people suffer the consequences. Especially when Major, finally realizing what a nut job his boss is, kidnaps Liv to prevent her from sacrificing herself, and feeds her 50s housewife brain so she'll stay stranded outside the city in brainwashed domestic bliss until after the executions go down. There's betrayals within Fillmore Graves, some of which turn out to be triple crosses, half the cast is on the lam, and Ravi absolutely botches a moment with Peyton by needlessly making, and then explaining, a Star Wars reference. It's fantastic. Despite presenting gray area societal questions regarding shortages versus salvation, it's pretty clear iZombie is more comfortable doing black and white heroes versus villains, and the finale fairly aggressively reduces the moral conundrums of season 4 to a good versus evil showdown. Chase Graves is killed in an awkwardly edited altercation that makes me wonder if they didn't get enough coverage the day they shot it. Major is immediately given full command of the military government he just publicly betrayed, Peyton becomes acting mayor, and Liv is given the all clear to continue human smuggling without Fillmore Graves' interference. And, as we'll see next season, Ravi becomes Seattle's CDC liaison. The main cast went from being the most wanted people in Seattle to all of them literally running it, and all it took was Gallaghering Chase Graves. There will be strains on the city's brain supply next season, and Chase Grave loyalists intent on taking down Major from within, but unlike previous seasons, iZombie Season 4's finale doesn't even hint at these dangers to come. As a consequence, aside from a few tears shed for Liv's dead boyfriend de jure, the resolution feels a little too pat. Notably since all the characters, especially Major, did some ethically questionable things throughout the season, but I guess smushing Chase Graves means never having to say you're sorry. Is that Paul Rudd narrating? Yeah, sounds like it. Paul Rudd, he's a good kid. Those gray area issues were all part of iZombie's new Seattle world building, which is an interesting case. The world building in the fourth season is sometimes a strength and sometimes a weakness. With zombieism out in the open, the writers showcase some of the sillier possibilities of this brave new world that are fun to explore. Zombie pickup artists discussing the admissibility of visions in a court of law, fine dining establishments compete to secure the most desirable prime grade brains for their clientele, a group of LARPers realize they can take LARPing to the next level and genuinely hack and slash at each other, since only destroying the brain is fatal. Turning the Ren Fair into Zombie Fight Club. And going even further than that, if somebody lies about being a zombie, joins the LARP, and dies in a playful zombie sword fight, is it manslaughter or just a Darwin Award? There's a zombie production of Rent that replaces AIDS with the zombie virus, in defiance of copyright law, but hey, you want to hand me my cease and desist? Good luck. You're in New York, I'm in Seattle. There is a militarized border wall and 10,000 zombies between you and my stage. Good luck stopping me. Those playful aspects make up about 30% of iZombie's world building focus, but the lion's share goes to heavier stuff. iZombie is certainly trying to say something with its new Seattle zombie city. Or more accurately, it's trying to say everything. Kids infected with the zombie virus being disowned by their families, similar to teens coming out of the closet. Premium brains for the rich versus diluted, mashed up brain tube rations for the impoverished mirrors wealth disparity. Liv's human smuggling operation, coyotes that exploit the people they're meant to sneak across the border, and the argument of saving lives versus limited resources mean the Fillmore Graves no entry blockade serves as a stand in for immigration and healthcare. Fortunately, aside from the episode where they use the term fake news like 37 times, the fourth season isn't beating you over the head with its political messaging. More just hinting at it and letting the audience connect the dots themselves. Savor that degree of subtlety while it lasts. Though in tackling so many hot-button issues all in tandem, iZombie does run into some awkward mixed metaphors from time to time. They use zombies as a proxy for any and all marginalized groups that you can imagine. But then when it comes time to make a commentary on the police state having its boot on the neck of society, it's a zombie foot 
in the boot. The show also gets so preoccupied with real-world analogies that some elements of the world building are left on the table or flimsy and don't hold up to scrutiny. In season two, Major was able to store his zombie captives without needing to continually feed them by freezing them. And Chase Graves freezes zombies as punishment for non-capital offenses. Desperate times, desperate measures. I found myself thinking all season, if the brain supply got really dire and I were Chase Graves, I'd be Mr. White Christmas, I'd be Mr. Snow, and I'd be drumming up all sorts of charges for anyone who looked at me funny so I could throw them into stasis with the popsicles and the ice cream and take a few hungry mouths out of the population. Especially since the show clearly wants to make Chase an unambiguous villain by the end of the season, that's a more naturally villainous scheme than just having him hulk out and go, I want to execute Liv, even if the city will turn against me. Plus, hey, prison industrial complex. Bonus societal issue that my armchair screen reading stumbled on by accident. Also, it always struck me as odd that despite the city being taken over by an occupying military instituting their own laws, apparently the Seattle Police Department both still exists and functions business as usual. Something tells me there might have been a few more changes made than the one or two nods to Fillmore Graves having some minor new directives for the local PD. Crimes against zombies are under Fillmore Graves' jurisdiction, as you well know. I hate that guy. Of course, the status quo remains the same at the station, so that Liv, Clive, and Ravi can still investigate murders each week. While I praised the show in previous seasons for making Liv a fully fleshed out character, influenced by the brain she eats, season 4 falls into a bad habit of completely overriding her personality and replacing it with the victim of the weeks. Also, previous seasons the brains frequently aided the cases, while simultaneously causing strife in her personal life as it was slowly revealed that the person whose brains she ate was usually a dick who sort of had it coming. But now the brains are botching both her relationships and the cases. Liv's seeming inability to even try to rein in the impulses of the brains she's on makes her do some pretty obnoxious and mean-spirited things throughout the season, though nothing ever manages to top the end of season three, where she cheats on her boyfriend with Chase Graves, blames it on the brain, then the whole affair never comes up again for the rest of the series. In the fourth season's defense, while well, Liv going all in on the personalities is starting to grate, giving Major, Blaine, Donnie, and the once-a-month vaccinated Ravi opportunities to ham it up and indulge in some wacky alternate personas of their own is a fun chance for those actors to stretch their legs. I got dosed with wrestler brain. We heard you. <laughs> hey, Liv, how is it going with the new boyfriend? Also acting odd and awkward is Clive, who got back together with Bazio at the end of season three, only for Bazio to wind up receiving a tainted shot. Since they can no longer get physical, they've decided to pursue an obviously doomed open relationship. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but... <laughs> but it might work for us. At first, it's clearly Bazio's idea. Clive isn't even putting himself out there while she's out in the town, which makes him horribly uncomfortable. But then when he finally does have sex, she reveals she's just been out flirting with guys, not having sex with them. So now she's mad at him, but forgive me. If it was all about not being able to have sex, then why go out and do stuff you can do with Clive? with other guys, whatever. Realizing their communication is utterly horrible and tearing each other's hearts apart, the two realize there's only one logical thing they can do. They get married. Clive is so down bad he's ready to turn zombie for her. But Liv gives Bazio the magic immunity brain to cure her after their nuptials. So, just like the rest of the cast, they made a lot of bad choices, seemingly didn't learn from them, but got rewarded with everything they wanted at the last minute anyways. Speaking of characters who always get away with things, let's check in with Blaine, who spends most of season 4 attempting a variety of bizarre money-making schemes curing the mayor, then shooting him on air to prove the cure works so he can sell the cures he stole in the black market, and buying a bunch of cheap real estate in zombie territory, planning to spread the zombie virus around the world so the wall will come down and his property values will spike. In order to zerg rush the wall, Blaine requests the services of his father, who was released from his captivity at the bottom of the well in the season premiere by a defecting henchman. It turns out his time trapped in the well made him insane, and Blaine's father returns to Seattle as a radical, murderous zombie preacher who robs brains from the rich and gives to the needy, and wants the undead to inherit the earth. I need an army. Give me an army. 
and verily will have them by the short and curlies. I have no earthly clue what in God's name possessed the writers to take the character in this direction. But I actually found Brother Love's time on the screen to be a highlight of season four solely because of how inexplicable and bizarre it is. And despite Blaine and his father's bad blood being mostly told, not shown, the two actors are able to sell the conflicting emotions of the final moments between father and son. Even if the circumstances those emotions are swelling up in are utterly preposterous. Blaine's father is finally proud of him, even though it's only because he's gone insane and only because Blaine is manipulating him, but Blaine still feels guilty that he can't keep his father's pride when he refuses to tag along on his congregation's final doomed charge out of the city of zombies. Soldiers came across Seattle's self-declared zombie prophet. They made sure he wouldn't cause any more problems. Brother Love may have gone to the great brain buffet in the sky, but the rest of us are still stuck in Seattle. And that's season four. The shift to a zombie city was certainly ambitious, especially since iZombie is not the most high budget show, but frequently the season's ambitious energy was focused on taking characters in questionable or downright perplexing directions. Heading into iZombie's final season, the question isn't just where will the writers take the characters next, it's where will the writers leave them when all is said and done. You're responsible for brains making it to the city. It's how you live like a king. It's why people are willing to pretend that you're Jack Sparrow and not Jack the Ripper. After the demise of Chase Graves, New Seattle has entered an end of year in town situation. Sure, the tyrannical leader of the oppressive regime was defeated, but with his usurpers instituting policies that are reckless with resource management, society is collapsing faster than ever. Brains are in short supply, and with very few options to source them from, Major turns to master brain smuggler Blaine, who is quickly renowned as a local hero. Only a small circle knows of his litany of criminal antics, and they're keeping a lid on it for the good of zombie kind. To most of Seattle, Blaine's simply the celebutante keeping everybody fed. Meanwhile, both pro-zombie and anti-zombie terror campaigns have cropped up around the city. The pro-zombie campaign is being led by Martin Roberts, as well as Fillmore Graves' royal vizier, Enzo, whose agonizing fake Inspector Clouseau French accent was tolerable last season when he was a joke character, but is now insufferable since he's supposed to be taken seriously. The diabolical duo are working on some chemical compound that will allow them to control fully feral Romeros as mindless foot soldiers, solving the problem of zombies being outnumbered by humans, though the show ultimately does very little with that idea. As for the anti-zombie campaign, that's being helmed by Dolly Durkins, who's hell-bent on creating, say it with me now, fake news that portrays zombies in a negative light so people will take up arms against them. You might think a villain modeled after the Karen archetype would be a semi-comedic, love-to-hate villain, like Von Duclark before her, but iZombie actually treats the character deathly seriously, presumably because, unlike a zombie-exploiting brain harvester, a mass-murdering manufacturer of a tainted energy drink, or whatever they were going for with Chase Graves, the writers want audiences to see Dolly Durkins and think to themselves, this villain is scary, because there are real people just like her iZombie Season 5 certainly throws subtlety to the wind when it comes to its political messaging. I love zombies. Big fan of the culture. But we go all out too, you know, like white wig zombie makeup. So you paint your face and appropriate another culture. Blue lives matter? Uh-uh. White lives matter. Everything they said on TV is fake news. People have got to know. We've got to tell them, Dolly. They're so self-assured in taking the show in that direction, in fact, that one of the side plots of the final season involves the characters creating a sitcom with the sole intention of using it as a vehicle to distribute pro-zombie propaganda. And before you ask, no, this is not presented as some sort of nuanced ethical quandary questioning what role popular culture can or should play in influencing the political beliefs of the general public. The character involved in the sitcom who proposes focusing on entertainment ahead of pushing a message is unambiguously portrayed as a crass, lowbrow scumbag, while the characters focused on political messaging literally save New Seattle from nuclear annihilation by winning the heart and mind of a military general who winds up as a decided vote. Wow, 
TV shows really can make a difference and save the world. Thanks, iZombie. Because you wasted my time with that stupid-ass plot, I'm gonna throw my car battery in the ocean. Speaking of stupid-ass plots, out of nowhere, Liv runs into her mother again. And out of nowhere, Liv never knew who her dad was. Well, it turns out Liv's deadbeat dad is pro-zombie terrorist Martin Roberts. Not only is he working on puppeteering Romero's, but he's the inventor of Utopium, including tainted Utopium, so yeah. Meet Patient Zero of the Zombie Epidemic. Wait, I just covered Chuck last month. The creator of the special power that was the inciting incident of the series turned out to be the main character's long-lost deadbeat dad again. Why does this keep happening? Martin wants to radicalize Liv, but Liv's kind-heartedness de-radicalizes him instead. Enzo, the actual joke character, shoots Martin dead but not before Liv and Ravi secure Martin's formula for tainted utopium, the last ingredient needed to make a cure. Despite being a final season that goes into things knowing it's going to be the final season, iZombie Season 5 is surprisingly short on momentum. The competing villains' terror campaigns both have vague, impractical endgames, which makes it hard to get excited anticipating the heroes thwarting their plans. And the series pooters around doing completely standard cases of the week, almost like it's blissfully unaware it only has 13 short episodes to wrap all these storylines and character arcs up. As far as highlights of Season 5, some of the brains of the week make for lighthearted, endearing fun. The dance competition episode was a standout, as was the noir episode, where, amusingly, Liv eats the brains of a hard-boiled P.I., while Blaine eats the brains of a femme fatale. Here's hoping that curiosity has the same effect on you as on the proverbial cat. Why so hateful, more? How long you got? For you? All night. When it comes to larger narrative highlights, the season does pick up the pace and remind me of the glory days on two occasions. The first is in the mid-season episode The Scratchmaker, a Blaine focus episode where his history of criminal acts are revealed to the public in an expose. And not only is his fall from grace and desperate efforts to salvage whatever he can of his glamorous lifestyle enthralling, but the city's frantic scramble to secure a new brain source since they short-sightedly locked up their mover and shaker, makes for some genuinely intriguing world building. Wow, it's almost like when they're more concerned with their own world in the television than ours out here, the dramatic stakes and character conundrums are actually intriguing again. The second spark of life is the penultimate episode of the series, learning that the corrupt CDC researcher Saxon intends to exploit the zombie crisis for fun and profit by releasing costly, unending treatment plans instead of cheap, one-and-done cures, the gang goes on an Ocean's Eleven-style heist to steal the cure they handed over to the government back and distribute it themselves. Only, instead of building a team of skilled pickpockets, hackers, and greasemen, they're collecting the brains of dead pickpockets, hackers, and greasemen, then eating whichever they need to bypass the next security measure they come across. Holy crap, we really did it. Clive, we did it. We did do it. And we should get out of here before he regains consciousness and we undo it. I'm a sucker for a high story, and the second to last hour of iZombie was such a remarkable delight that it kinda made me feel like an asshole for being so harsh on the rest of season 5 leading up to it. Not to worry though, the finale would quickly write that ship. My only problem with the big heist is, who's this Saxon guy? Blaine was down and out in the Scratchmaker after losing everything, with only one asset to his name. One last dose of the cure. You picking up what I'm putting down? Why, oh why, oh why, isn't Blaine the mastermind behind the scam zombie treatment plan? He should have taken his dose to the CDC instead of just having side character Candy steal it in the noir episode. Perfect parallels to his scheme from season one of forcing people to sign up for a never-ending extortionate product only he can provide. Plus, he can present himself to the globe as the man who cured zombieism, and proclaim the fame he was relishing at the start of the season as Seattle's savior. Instead, Blaine spends the second half of the season manhunting teenagers with zombie immunity, so he can sell their brains as cures. It's tough as an audience to get too animated about Blaine's final venture. Either the CDC's cure or Ravi's cure is gonna hit the streets any day now, bud. You know what they call the teenage immune brain racket? Unsustainable business model. You didn't mention they were kids. Teens, who other than the random passage of time are basically adults. <laughs> Why do they care? Maybe if he sold earlier, Blaine would have gotten away with it. But because of those meddling kids, Ravi and Peyton, his abducted teens got away tracking them down in the finale, he also abducts Peyton. 
turning her into a zombie and going for the whole supervillain seduction over dinner thing, only to be unceremoniously shoved down a well by his repeatedly slighted underling Donnie, who was engaged to one of the kids Blaine killed. I mean, I'm pretty sure she was 18, but if you're still feeling creeped out, don't worry, Donnie is shoved down the well right after him by Liv. So that's it for iZombie's series-spanning villain, Blaine. No grand evil scheme, no fight to the death, no villainous gloating or final speech, or nothing. It's sort of ambiguous if he even died at all. I get that the show was trying to do like a thing, like Blaine met the horrible fate he had planned for his father, but I seriously doubt Liv is going to come back to the well to feed him regularly just to torture him for all eternity. And if she does, it's Blaine. Dude's just gonna get out eventually. The guy comes back more often than William Afton. That's the last episode. Not my problem anymore, the writer seemed to say. At least I wasn't bored. I'd rather be dead. <laughs> you were saying! All that's left to do is prove to the world that the zombie cure is legit. Since after the whole Fillmore Graves tainted vaccine that started all this mess, public trust in injections cooked up by one guy in a morgue has gone way down. On live TV, Major has a showdown with the love child of Hans Landa and Pepe Le Pew, offering to prove the cure works by letting Enzo shoot him to death with center mass shots. Enzo does, but it was actually a heroic final stand trick where Major used a fake cure, then they injected Enzo with the real cure, and then gunned down Enzo as their live demonstration. It's actually a clever little showdown, but any enjoyment is mitigated by the fact that, yeah, it's Enzo. He's not a charming, funny villain where audiences relish his time on screen, or a straight-up detestable love-to-hate foe that the audience just wants to see get his. He's a villain you just kind of don't want to see at all. Oh well. We don't have to see him anymore now. As the French say, I'll feed his in. The head of Fillmore Graves isn't a zombie anymore. Where's your red eyes and your super strength? Shouldn't I be dead by now? <laughs> Realizing how lame these final villain deaths are, last baddie standing Dolly Durkins opts to simply not have one, instead sending her goons to detonate an improvised explosive at the Seattle PD's morgue, which takes us into iZombie's obligatory what happened to the gang 10 years later time skip. Naturally, all the couples got married and lived happily ever after, which is all well and good, but rather than using this final wrap-up to explore the state of the post-cure world or the fate of some beloved side characters a decade in the future, the majority of the time skip is spent attempting to fake audiences out and convince them Liv is dead. Once the interview wraps, Liv and Major appear, unsurprisingly alive and well, or rather, undead and well, having opted not to cure their zombieism and now living on a secluded island with their fellow undead. With a wink, they invite the human cast to come over any time, Immortality is just a scratch away. Or a bite, if you're into that sort of thing. It's like the writers made a discussion post online, asking for examples of what to include in a good final entry, but then all the commenters deliberately gave them bad examples as a joke. iZombie Season 5 falls for every bad finale cliché in the book, sticking around with cases of the week all season, then rushing through a potential main story arc in the last two hours introducing a love interest for the wacky side character out of nowhere so they can get engaged after two dates, introducing a deadbeat dad character out of nowhere so the main character can have a reunion, revealing the main character's deadbeat parents were secretly the catalyst that instigated the events of the series, killing off the fan-favorite villain in a pathetically anticlimactic way, killing off all the real villains prematurely so the final showdown has to be against a shitty, ineffectual side villain, and finally, that old chestnut, the main character dying in a random explosion, only to reveal they used the blast to fake their death so they could travel abroad and live their best life. Every year, I took a holiday. I went to Zombie Island. There's this cafe on the banks of the Zombie Arno. Every fine evening, I'd sit there and order a brain. I had this fantasy that I would look across the tables and I'd see live there with Major and maybe a couple of kids. She wouldn't say anything to me nor me to her, but we'd both know that she'd made it. That she was happy. Ah, okay, that's enough of that. So that's iZombie. Well, I think it's admirable the show avoided sticking to the status quo year after year, attempting some grander narratives as the scope of the story expanded. It's probably abundantly clear by this point in the video that I don't feel the writer's energy was particularly focused on the elements it needed to be to make the zombie city storylines thrive. Still, even the later seasons have their moments. 
sometimes extravagant zombie city societal implosion moments, other times just refreshing and cute, back to basics, case of the week moments. I doubt I'll ever feel the need to revisit the later years of the series again, but in contrast to some other shows I've covered on the channel, they aren't so appalling that they retroactively taint my image of the series as a whole. When I think of iZombie, I think of the golden years, and I'm sure I'll be back someday to dine on those again. Maybe when the series gets rebooted as an actual adaptation of the comic it's based on. From what I've heard, the only elements of the iZombie comic that the show keeps are the rules surrounding the zombie virus and the title. And let's face it, the title is terrible. So thank you, Rob Thomas, even if it was only for a few years, because of this show, television got a little bit smoother. Yeah, it's just Clive, what's George R. R. Martin up to right now? Not writing. 